Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the editor of the New Books Network, and you're listening to an episode on Grinnell College's Authors and Artists podcast. And today I'm very pleased to say we have Jill Peterson on the show. She, together with her co author, James Densley, has written a very timely book called The Violence Project How to Stop a Mass Shooting epidemic. And we will be talking about that book during the course of the interview today. Jill, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Could you begin the interview by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I graduated from Grinnell College in 2003 with a sociology degree. And actually, when I was at Grinnell, I did an internship with an alum who was a forensic social worker in Chicago, which is what kind of set me down the path that I'm now on. Um, After I graduated, I worked as an investigator at the New York Capitol Defender's Office in New York City, working, investigating the life histories of men who were facing the death penalty in New York for a number of years. And then after New York got rid of the death penalty, I went to graduate school out in California, where I got a PhD in psychology and social behavior. And I am now a associate professor of criminology at Hamlin College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I'm also co-founder of the nonprofit, The Violence Project. Yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about The Violence Project. What is it? Yes, it started as a research study about five years ago, kind of a code word for the research that we were doing into the lives of mass shooters. And it since developed into a nonprofit research center that's a nonpartisan center focused on using data and research to prevent violence. And the project itself involved a collection of a lot of data. And this uh, manifests itself in the book. Uh, I should tell the listeners that the book is very data rich. And this is one thing that I appreciate about it because we have lots of intuitions about mass violence. I think many of them are wrong. And it's nice to actually see data from someone like Jill uh, who can show us where our intuitions are right and wrong. How did you collect the data for um, the substance of this book? Yeah, we started with just kind of a group of passionate students who wanted to volunteer. And me and my co-author, James Densley, we realized that there was so little information about mass shooters out there. Um, So my, you know, I come from a background of really trying to understand the life histories of perpetrators to understand what these pathways to violence look like so we can build intervention and prevention programs. And when it came to mass shootings, it was clear that we did not understand who these perpetrators were, where they were coming from, why we were seeing so many of these shootings. So we started by making a list of every perpetrator who had killed four or more people in a public space going back to 1966. So there's about 180 perpetrators. And then we coded them on about 200 different pieces of life history information, all using publicly available records. So the students we were working with would kind of dig into the dark corners of the internet and find as much information as they could And we built this into this kind of massive database. Um, And then we got funding from the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the Department of Justice that let us really kind of amplify the work, move more quickly, and also conduct interviews across the country. So we interviewed perpetrators of mass shootings, people who knew perpetrators like parents um, and siblings, and also victims and first responders. And it became this really kind of comprehensive research study into the lives of these perpetrators. So this is really the first time we have actual empirical data about these horrific events. I don't know if it's the first time, but it's a principal contribution there too. Yes, I think... People had collected kind of the, you know, who, what, where, and why. I I would say who, what, where, maybe not the why. So this is the first time there's really a deep dive into, you know, what did the childhoods look like of these perpetrators? What were the days and weeks like? What mental health diagnoses did they have? Did they play violent video games? All these things that we talk about when we talk about public policy and we talk about mass shootings in the media, this is the first time we'd put together the data. Mm-hmm. Well, congratulations on that. I can only imagine how much work it was. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think yeah. people realize how hard this work is. It's It yeah. really is. Yeah. It's very hard. So let's get right into the data. One of my intuitions tell me tells me that the number of mass shootings 
and this is a particular kind of shooting. It takes place uh, in a public space. It is four or more people. Is that right? Yes, four or yes. more people. No. Okay, so within those confines, my intuition tells me that the number of these things has gone up over the last, I don't know how many decades. Is that true? That is true. And it is really important to be precise about the definition because depending on what definition you use, you get all sorts of different numbers. So we use this really conservative definition because we were really interested in this very specific phenomenon of a person walking into a public space, shooting indiscriminately, and then four or more people killed is kind of the threshold used by the FBI and different sort of research institutions. So we went with that one. And using that definition, yes, you see that they have been rising over time. Um, the death counts have been getting higher over time as well, um, with the worst years on record being 2017, 2018, 2019. Although I think 21, we might surpass that depending on how the year goes. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it is actually empirically true that the frequency of these that still all you know very rare events is going up. Yes. Yes. Okay. We can we can um, we can uh, stand on that as a finding. <laughs> now, again, one of my intuitions tells me that this is a to use a little bit of fancy terminology here. It's uh, a a kind of psychogenic. I don't know what word I'm looking for here. That pe people are copying one another. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That there's kind of like, it's like, it's not hysteria, but, you know, you saw this, for example, with anorexia. When anorexia, mm -hmm. anorexia got into the news, suddenly a lot of young women were finding that they, they had anorexia. And many mm -hmm. people said that this was some sort of psychogenic, again, I'm, 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 I don't, I can't find the word epidemic, I guess, of this. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think this is a reasonable explanation of why we're seeing an increase in the number of these things? Yes, I do certainly think that's a part of it. In the book, we call it a social contagion. Hey, uh, that's better. I don't know yeah. how I could come up with that. I, boy, I'm sorry, listeners. I couldn't come up with social contagion. <laughs> so we do see that when you see mass shootings kind of cluster. So there'll be one will happen and then two or three will quickly follow. And we've seen this over time when you study the lives of perpetrators they study each other they do they see themselves in the perpetrators that came before them they go into chat rooms and dark corners of the internet where these perpetrators are really celebrated um and they can kind of get radicalized with these other individuals who are thinking like them and then it does seem to be that when someone is kind of on the edge, when someone is hopeless and angry and suicidal, someone does this and it gets this huge amount of media attention. Their face is all over the news. Their manifesto is going viral. It does inspire sometimes people to come behind them. So that social contagion aspect we know is a part of this. Right. So this would, if we see uh, one, then probabilistically the chances that there will be another is increased in the time thereafter yes, because of the bit. social contagion. Yes, I see just what you yeah. mean. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, why these mass shooters shoot. Um, one of the things that you study in the Violence Project is uh, uh, you call it a noticeable crisis in the period before the shooting. H how do you identify someone who's having a noticeable crisis and what percentage of the shooters were having no noticeable crises? Mm -hmm. So our data shows it's about 82% of perpetrators, we could say were in a noticeable crisis, which we define as a marked change in behavior from their own baseline. And it's a short period of time. It's not something that goes on forever. It's a period of time where whatever's happening in their life is overwhelming their ability to cope and they are acting different. And that different does look a little bit different for each perpetrator. They Some of them get more aggressive or more agitated or paranoid. Um, some of them are isolating, but people around them are noticing that things are different and that they're acting strange. And during this period of time, a lot of them actually leak their plans, which leakage is a term that means kind of telling other people what you're planning to do. So they might post about it on social media or tell their peers. Um, so it's kind of this this really important period of time where their behavior is changing. They're talking about violence. They're planning, and we see that really consistently 
um, and these perpetrators. And so it's a period of time where we think intervention is really critical. Yeah, this is a point where uh, an observant person might see uh, someone they know acting, well, not to put too fine a point on it, strangely. Mm -hmm. And then this heightened awareness might lead to notifying someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm interested in why they make their plans public. Did you get any insight into why they do that? Is this, again, it kind of reminds me of the, of well, again, uh, a warning to the listeners, I'm going to talk a little bit about suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, so if this is concerning to you, don't listen. Um, that, that people will signal their intention to commit suicide before they do it. Yes. Um, so uh, is there a similar sort of thing going? Is this a cry for help? It is. Um, that's what our research shows. And we we did a study that we published in JAMA where we looked at is leakage this sort of excitement, narcissistic type of thing, more so how serial killers might kind of play with the police. That was one theory. And then the other theory is that it is more of a last minute cry for help, like somebody see what I'm doing and reach out. And we found that it is more of a cry for help. And when we talked to perpetrators, they would say it was more of a cry for help, kind of this last minute cry into the void to say, I'm thinking about this. Is anyone going to stop me? Um, and, you know, we did their horrific homicides, but in addition, they're designed to be the perpetrator's final act. The perpetrator goes in without any escape plan. They're either going to kill themselves, be killed, or spend the rest of their life in prison. And so a lot of what we know actually from the suicide prevention world can be really applicable when we're talking about preventing mass shootings. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the locale of these. Once somebody has sadly decided to uh, embark on this horrible endeavor, then they uh, have to pick a place to do it. And your data set is constrained to public places. Uh, what kind of public places do these generally occur? So perpetrators tend to pick a place that is representative of their grievance with the world. So what we see is a lot of these perpetrators are kind of self-loathing, suicidal, depressed, isolated, hopeless. Then there's a point at which that turns and they kind of think, whose fault is this that I feel this way, right? And so when they, some people pick their school because they blame their peers, other perpetrators pick racial groups or women. I'm sorry, uh, can I uh, interrupt you? Just, you? just as you said, other people pick their workplace, uh, it broke up a little bit. So if you oh, could no. just start with the sentence, other people pick their workplace. Sure. Other people pick their workplace, other perpetrators pick, you know, racial groups or religious groups or women that they've decided this is whose fault it is. And so the location ends up being representative of their grievance with the world. And these are really, we call them a form of performance crime. It is meant to be watched and witnessed. So the goal is to make the biggest headlines to be seen in a way for doing this in a way that these perpetrators aren't seen in life to be kind of remembered and make the history books. And so they also pick locations where they're going to have the biggest headlines. Mm -hmm. So this, this points to a second kind of intervention. So the first one, just to remind the listeners was if you see someone in notable, not noticeable crisis and they seem to be signaling an intent to do this, this is, you definitely want to contact somebody. Yes. Like, yes. So the second one is about these locations would it be advisable, and some people claim it should be, to somehow protect these locations better than we do? Is the frequency of these events such that we need to make them, well, to use a military phrase, kind of harder targets? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this advisable in any way? Because you hear people talking about we should arm school teachers and stuff like this. I don't know. Um, but is is this something that we should think about? I mean, our data would say no, only because most perpetrators are insiders, right? These are not outsiders coming into a location that they don't know. Perpetrators of school shootings are students of the school. Perpetrators of workplace shootings work at that location. They yeah. are moving in and out of that security. They know where the armed officers are. They've been through the active shooter drills. They know how this all works. And so I think a lot of things we do in terms of hardening assume it's sort of these outsiders coming in. The reality is this is insiders. And so a lot of that hardening won't be as, as effective. And actually what we know is protective, particularly in school 
schools is things like warm, trusting environments with really strong relationships. And some of that hardening can run counter to the type of environments we know kind of foster this protective, safe school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, one, one of, again, one, another one of my intuitions, which I'm sure is probably wrong, well, I don't know, I'll ask you, is that somehow these people are deeply mentally ill, not that they're going through some sort of momentary, momentary crisis, but they are, uh, they are uh, diagnosably mentally ill um, in some way that we should probably have seen. Is this true? It's a really complicated question. And I will say that question is the one that originally led me into studying mass shootings because um, before this, my area of research really was the relationship between mental illness and violence. And it, when we talk about mass shootings, that comes up again and again and again. And so we really did, did a deep dive into this, right? Who's been diagnosed? Who's been in counseling? Who takes medication? Who's been hospitalized previously? Who's maybe showing signs of mental illness but isn't diagnosed? That's all in the database. What we find is when it comes to very serious and persistent mental illness, particularly psychosis, so hallucinations and delusions, mm -hmm. It is overrepresented compared to the general population, but still a small minority of perpetrators. Um, so it's only about 10% of perpetrators where we can say these individuals were really being driven by psychosis. The rest of them, it's a much more complicated story. Now, the majority of perpetrators do have some sort of mental health history, and of course you can say they're not mentally healthy, well individuals, but there's no kind of diagnosis that goes with this. And you cannot say that any particular diagnosis leads to this. What we see is these complex histories, these stories that develop over time, this pathway to violence. And for some mental health is a piece of that, for some it's not. And so I think in many ways, we've oversimplified the question in our public discourse. It's either they're mentally ill or they're not. And my answer is, is a really complicated and complex question, right? And um, there's not a simple yes, no. But I think anytime we try to blame this on mental illness, we can't do that. We know that it's a lot more complicated. Right. And the reason I ask the question is because there's another intervention that would be possible. If, if we found that people with certain diagnosable mental illnesses were more likely to do this, we might put them under heightened scrutiny. Um, right. An example I'm thinking is uh, child abusers. They're under a lot of heightened scrutiny mm -hmm. uh, b because they are, uh, if you, well, they, they are supposed to be more, they're, they're likely recidivists uh, if they're not monitored. But in, in the case of your data, you don't show this, no heightened scrutiny for people with mental illnesses. No, certainly not. Yeah. I mean, I think we really focus on people who are in crisis, who are leaking plans about violence, who are actively suicidal, and that has no relationship with a specific diagnosis. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the means by which they do this. Uh, it, it, does it always involve guns, or are there cases in which you found that there were other types of weapons involved? We only track cases where the perpetrator used a gun. I see. So okay. There are databases that track things like arson and stabbings. We are only focused on shootings. Uh huh. And and were you able to find out where they got the guns? We do. So we ended up building an entire gun database, which is also publicly available. It has every gun used in every mass shooting that we studied. So it's four or 500 different guns. And we tracked how they got them, when they got them, um, if they were modified, sort of anything that we could come up with. And the majority of perpetrators do purchase their guns legally, with the exception of school shooters. So school shooters are typically too young to buy guns because they're students of the school, and they are taking them from parents and family members who don't have them safely secured. But generally, most perpetrators are per doing legal purchases. Right. And so here's another place where there might be an intervention in a different country, <laughs> but not the United <laughs> right. States. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Not the and United our, States. <laughs> yes, our data does point to some things that ha I think are gaining more universal support. So things like safe storage has pretty widespread support amongst both gun owners and non-gun owners. 
And things like red flag laws for people who are in crisis, things like waiting periods, um, raising the minimum age, some of those things, we are seeing some movement. I'm hopeful some movement is starting and our data would really support all of those things as a preventative measure. Mm -hmm. So were you able to draw any conclusions um, and this is a little bit broader discussion of how people get into this nihilistic state, because it seems to me, w- once you have decided to do this, you have already traveled a kind mm-hmm. of road to what I can really only call nihilism. You you think the world is a terrible place and you're going to go out with, a, a you know, with, you know, in a display of horrible inhumanity. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is there any how do people get into this state? Because sometimes you'll see people say, well, you know, our, the, the culture itself is producing people like this willy nilly. And it's because of this, that and the other thing. Um, do, do you have any insights there? Yeah, I mean, we see in the early lives of perpetrators, really significant early childhood trauma and really, I mean, really horrific things with physical abuse and sexual abuse or suicide of a parent. And of course, millions of people experience that would never do anything like this, but that does seem to be kind of the early foundation. And then this develops over time where these perpetrators are becoming kind of depressed and hopeless and isolated. And then there is this radicalization piece. And I do think social media has accelerated this because it used to be if you were thinking this way, you would have to go find someone else right in your school or your class who was also thinking this way to validate you. Now you have access to kind of the entire world and you can find these communities online that really do validate your thinking. And a lot of the family members we talked to would say, you know, he was he was very depressed and you know, when things shifted was when he found this online community that kind of emboldened him to do some of these things. So I think there's that piece of it too. And then of course, there's this whole, my co-author is a sociologist, whereas I'm a psychologist, but there's this whole other level of kind of American culture um, around this. Um, And especially in the past four years, where we saw the worst years on record for mass shootings were when Donald Trump was president and there was kind of a different level of hateful discourse um, in our public spaces. So it's hard to kind of say this is the one thing that causes this or this is the exact pathway, but we do see these patterns. Right, right. Well, I agree completely with what you said about the uh, Internet. Um, One of the things, wonderful things that the Internet does is it enables to find people who have interests similar to ours. And I think this is a great benefit for society. I mean, the New Books Network itself is a kind of product of that. If if you are interested in Indian religions or South Asian studies, monographs about South Asia, well, we have your people. And that's right. great. You know, that's just yeah. fantastic. I mean, I was a medieval Russian historian. <laughs> like, how, <laughs> how in the world is I going to find other people in the medieval? But on the internet, I can. Yeah. And, and, and that's wonderful. But on the other hand, there are these other ways in which this aggregation of interest occurs, which are more nefarious. And this is one of them. So this suggests a a possible intervention. And again, I don't want to encourage the surveillance state, but uh, aren't the authorities looking for message boards or Reddit threads or Facebook groups or I don't know what, where this kind of nihilism is talked about openly? You know, I think we are just on the brink of these conversations um, in terms of, you know, you don't want, um, you know, we have free speech and you don't want necessarily people sort of policing um, all social media platforms and identifying potential school shooters. At the same time, I think there's questions about what is the responsibility of social media platforms when this type of extreme hateful rhetoric is occurring on their platforms. Um, And I don't think we've figured that out yet. Um, I'm curious to see where this conversation goes over the next few years in terms of kind of whose responsibility is that, how extreme can it get? And when it turns into real world violence, um, sort of how responsible and who's responsible. Um, So I think that's coming. Yeah, I mean, it is a it is a big problem, and we've only just started to talk about it. I, I think I can say with some confidence that 
freedom of speech and freedom of association are pretty much fundamental to being Americans. Exactly. Like that's kind yeah. of who we are. It is. But in this case, um, there are some trade-offs that might have to be made. Right. <laughs> Very right. painful trade-offs. Yes. Um, and I think part of it comes down to what do we do with those red flags? And so one thing we talk about in the book is our our reaction to sort of threats of violence has been very punitive, right? So we come in with the police and we might arrest you for making terroristic threats or, you know, there's kids sitting in prison for 10 years because of something they posted on TikTok. I don't think that's a productive way to respond. Rather than saying when someone's posting this, when they're talking about this, this is a cry for help. This is a person that needs intervention and resources. How do we build systems that can reach out and say, hey, we're worried about you. How can we get you connected? Well, so I'm glad, a- I, yeah, I was going to say, I'm glad you mentioned resources because this is actually a quite a good place to, to, to stop the interview with a discussion of What should you do if you find somebody you know going through one of these noticeable crises? Who should you, whom should you contact? Are there resources available to say, okay, I'm really worried about Jane or John. I saw them doing something that was very abnormal and I feel like something needs to be done. Who do you contact? Mm -hmm. I think that is actually what we're really missing because, you know, I've talked to mothers or perpetrators who will say, I was worried about my kid, but I wasn't going to call the police and say, I think my kid might be a school shooter. And the police aren't really the right people to intervene in that situation because no law has been broken. And so I think we really need to build these systems. Um, I think we need to build them in schools. We need to build them in workplaces. We need to build them in community organizations, places where people can report if they're worried about somebody, not because that person is going to be fired or expelled or criminally charged. Instead, you would have sort of a team approach where people would look into it, they would investigate, they would reach out, and they would try to connect that person with resources. We really don't have those systems, and that's what we need. And they don't take necessarily some act of Congress to build those. They do take resources within schools and workplaces and some training, but we're starting to see some school districts trying to build those teams that can really have that more holistic response where students, parents, teachers, they can report and go to when they're worried, knowing that there's going to be this kind of warmer, more holistic response. Yeah. And, and this also involves massive trade-offs and we have to have a discussion about it because just as you say, you, you don't want the authorities in scare quotes coming down on somebody simply because somebody contacted them saying John or Jane is acting weird. Right. You, Absolutely you, not. Yeah, that's no. bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, in the percentage of cases where John and Jane really is acting weird and John and Jane may go shoot someplace up, you definitely want some sort of approach that isn't calling the police. Because when you call right. the police, they come. Yeah. <laughs> and when you, as, as people who've, uh, you know, seen the police in action, when you call the police, you lose complete control of the situation. Yes. They are in charge. You're not in charge anymore. And, right. uh, and, and that can have its own harm. It can. Yes. Yeah, it really can. So is there, a, a, are, are there, are there, I just am kind of struggling because it seems to me like a national hotline or something where it's a uh-huh. kind of SWAT team of people who, <laughs> uh, who like you and, and your co-author who just know everything about this and then can sit down and discuss, well, yes, we should have some sort of intervention that is sensitive to the context would make sense. Mm-hmm. The best model I've seen is um, run by Sandy Hook Promise. They have a crisis center where they have an anonymous app. Um, it's used by about 2 million students, I think, across the country, where students can contact through this app if they're worried about either themselves or somebody else. It goes to crisis counselors who are there 24-7 who respond within one minute, and they start chatting with that student and try to figure out kind of what's going on. And sometimes that student just needs someone to talk to and kind of de-escalate them. Sometimes they do need to contact the police if it's very serious. Sometimes it's just sort of contacting the school to say, hey, this person contacted, why do you don't, why don't you look into it? But that type of model, I would love to see it sort of expanded um, into all communities because it just seems like something we're in desperate need of right now. 
Right. And this is something that you can study and actually build a database about, because w one of the ways in which our impressions of these things is skewed, or is that are skewed, <laughs> is skewed, is that we only hear about the successful cases of mass right. shooting. We yes. don't hear about the ones in which there was an intervention, and that intervention successfully stopped the perpetrator from killing a bunch of people. Yes, it's very true. I'm on the board of Sandy Hook Promise, and so I get to hear when when you know there's been foiled school shootings, yeah. and there's been at least a dozen very serious, very close calls that have been caught um, through this crisis center. But they're also catching you know kids who might commit suicide or self harm right. or other things. So there's kind of this diffusion of benefits. Well, that sounds like a wonderful program, and I I hope that something can be done. And I'm sure that you mm -hmm. and your co-author and the people of Sandy Hook are doing it. It's good work for all of us. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully people read the book. And one thing we tried to do is come up with things that individuals can do, institutions can do, and things we can do at the broader society. But I think sometimes we get caught at the broader society level. It feels so frustrating. But we tried to come up with things that individuals could do themselves tomorrow that can be a part of kind of this holistic violence prevention approach. Yes. I, and I, I had forgotten to say this, but you've reminded me to say it. The Violence Project has a wonderful website. Uh, you should go there. In fact, I would recommend that you go to you go to Google and type in the Violence Project takeaways. The first <laughs> return will show you a kind of summation of all the data and findings. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you should go buy the book, which is called yeah. The Violence Project, How to Stop <laughs> Mass Shooting and Epidemics. But if you don't buy the book, go to the Violence Project website where you'll find um, Jill and James's uh, data, and you'll find the, the key takeaways that, uh, that they determined in the result of their research. So I very much recommend you do that. Jill, Thank you very much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.